All right, so uh, yeah, we just left speaking about uh, the different uh, theologians and what they would say about uh, the, the encyclicals, some of them who just put them in a category of non-infallible statements. If you recall, without uh, really uh, deepening that too much, some of them would just not speak about it at all, uh, as we saw. And uh, so it's, uh, it's quite a, a recent phenom phenomena, as we mentioned last time. Um, by the way, that, uh, that uh, Smith that is mentioned here, it's not the same as the canonists. There are a lot of Smiths. Some of them are theologians, some of them are canonists. And I guess it turns out Smith is a common name in the US. <laughs> so, <laughs> so in any case, uh, you have different Smiths. All right, so uh, I think we just left at the, on page 140 of, the, of this article uh, on the paragraph beginning by the distinguished theologians, if I'm not mistaken, the distinguished theologians who deny the pa papal encyclicals the status of infallible st uh, documents teach nonetheless that the faithful are bound in conscience to accord these letters not only the tribute of respectful silence but also a definitive, uh, sorry, a definite and sincere internal religious assent. So they will at least say that it, it needs an internal religious assent just like uh, we said that the non-infallible magisterium always require that if it is the universal magisterium of the church or the one of the Roman pontiff. To this end, many of them, like Father de Groot, which uh, we will probably go into as well, apply to the encyclicals a teaching which the eminent and brilliant Domi Dominic Palmieri had developed uh, about the Catholic attitude towards non-infallible teaching in the church. So here he refers to uh, the book of Palmieri, which actually will be the basis of the next uh, tract of the, on the, the Roman pontiff. But we won't see because in his book he has a whole part on the church and then he has an entire part very developed on the Roman pontiff. So we obviously we're not going to do the church one because it's like a summary of ecclesiology, which you do uh, with the Groot and with what we have done. Um, but we will uh, we'll use him mainly for the Romano Pontifice for the, the tract on the Roman pontiff. But in any case, he did speak about that as well, Pegg also in his Revue Thomist article, which uh, actually, if you recall, is quoted in the notes that I gave you. So you had a lengthy extract from that article. And I always, I also told you that if somebody wanted the French, just tell me, I will give you the whole article. Okay. Uh, so in any case, Pegg makes this application with his usual clarity. So he's a prominent Dominican. French Dominican theologian, he wrote an entire commentary on St. Thomas. Uh, hence, it follows that the authority of, of the encyclicals is not at all the same as that of the solemn definition, the one properly so called. The def definition demands an assent without reservation and makes a formal act of faith obligatory. The case of the encyclical's authority is not the same. Uh, this authority of the papal encyclical is undoubtedly, uh, undoubtedly great. So here he actually quotes Pegg, so we can skip a little bit because we already uh, said all of those things. So let's look at the next page where it begins with Lerch, Lerche or Lercher. Oh, Nico, how do you? Sorry? Lercher. All right, so whenever I need to say the name, I will just ask you. Lercher. Something like that? All right. But then why do you write it Lercher? <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> anyway, teaches that the internal assent due to these pronouncements cannot be called certain according to the strictest philosophical meaning of a term. So you see that everybody basically says the same, and this is what we have said already. The assent given to such proposition is interpretative conditionatus, including the tacit condition that the teaching is accepted as true Quote, unless the church should at some time peremptorily define otherwise, or unless the decision should be discovered to be erroneous. Again, I'm not even able to give you one instance where that actually happened. So uh, then you have uh, Lyons, I suppose, Lyon. Uh, oh, that's an English uh, author, okay. So I guess Lyons. And Phillips use the same approach in describing the ascent Catholics are in conscience bound to give to the church's non-infallible teachings. Then Father Yves de la Brière speaks of the submission and hierarchical obedience due to this pronouncement. So you can see that, you know, it's the same idea 
even though they might use different terms. And then Monsignor Manzoni lists the encyclicals among the documents in which non-infallible teaching is to be found, which, as we say, is true, that there is some, uh, I mean, a great part of the encyclical which is not infallible necessarily, but you cannot just put the entire encyclical as non-infallible, okay? But at least some teaching found in it is not infallible, so he holds that the definition of which the Vatican Council speaks in proposing the doctrine of papal infallibility is to be found only in the exercise of a solemn as distinguished from the ordinary magisterium. So he follows a little bit what uh, Billot said. If you recall, Billot had this theory that uh, the ex cathedra conditions given by the Vatican Council, those were for solemn magisterium. Uh, he says the encyclicals belongs to the ordinary magisterium, so the Pope is infallible even. Basically, he doesn't use the, uh, the criteria given by the Vatican Council, uh, but still explain that somehow there is infallibility in it for whatever the Pope says directly. So I mentioned that, um, uh, as we said, it's a little bit confusing, in my opinion, to use that. Rather, I would say, in many places of the encyclicals, those conditions are fulfilled. That's what I would say. It makes it easier. <laughs> Uh, and I, it makes more sense, in my opinion, but um, it's not just my opinion, we'll see. So right now there's an article being copied right now uh, where it's a, a priest actually defends the same. But in any case, this is how they would explain it. In explaining the binding force of these non-infallible pron pronouncements, he, like Bishop Francis Eger uh, and Father Mangenot and McGuinness and Dickman, employs an explanation formulated by Cardinal Franzelin in his Tractatus de Divina Tradizione Scriptura. So again, you see that we have covered that already. So uh, Father Franzelin made the distinction between the authority of infallibility and the, the authority of pro uh, doctrinal providence. That's the way he called it. Uh, so you have it there. We won't read the whole thing again because we already saw that, okay? Um, but look at the next paragraph. The explanations developed by Franzelin and Bal by Palmieri are adequate and exact. This is Monsignor Fenton speaking. The first gives an excellent account of those teachings presented by the Holy See as propositions which can be taught safely. Palmieri, for his own part, offers a fine exposition of a status of propositions taught by competent authority, yet not presented as infallibly true. Both explanations can be employed profitably in dealing with some of the pronouncements of the various Roman congregations and with much of the teaching of the encyclical. It would seem, however, that it would be a serious mistake to imagine that they can properly be applied to the entire body of doctrine set forth in these papal documents. It must be noted that neither Franzelin nor Palmieri made such an explicit application in the development of their own theories. So, what he is saying is, is both Franzelin and Palmieri, when they explained that, the infallible safety and all of this, they were speaking about documents coming from the Roman congregations. They were not speaking about encyclicals. They were speaking about documents coming from the Roman congregations. Now, the argument that other theologians make and that we have made is that if it applies to the Roman congregations, all the more does it apply also to encyclicals because those are also documents coming from the Holy See, but they come directly from the Holy Father which is obviously stronger. Uh, several of the most influential modern theologians teach explicitly that some of the teachings in the papal encyclicals come to us as parts of the church's infallible doctrine. Thus, Tanqueray and de Guibert hold that some of the propositions set forth in the papal encyclicals are infallibly true, since they are presented by the Holy Father in his infallible ordinary magisterium. Cardinals Billot and Lépicier teach that many of the pronouncements contained in the encyclicals are to be accepted as infallibly true. The manuals of Hervé, Yale, Blanche, uh, Hermann, Schieben, and Seizuris, sorry if I mispronounce, show that their authors are convinced that the encyclicals cannot simply be dismissed as non-infallible documents. All right, so over time, basically, the theologians we're more precise about that uh, because remember the first one, they just say, okay, this is not infallible, end of story. They would not really deepen that too much. But over time, it became more and more clear that yes, there are some parts that are infallible. 
the manuals of Wilhelm Scannell, um, Michelich, I don't know who that is, Van Noort, Pesch, and Calgano come to the same conclusion uh, in another way by warning their readers that not all the teachings contained in the encyclicals are to be considered as infallible. So that's the way they would put it. Not everything contained in the encyclical is infallible, which I would agree with, but meaning there are some that is. <laughs> okay. Uh, first Ston, I suppose, also teaches that some of the teachings contained in the encyclicals are to be received as infallibly proposed. Brunsman, I don't know who that is, contents himself with the observation that the doctrinal encyclicals impose an obligation upon the consciences of all the faithful. All right, so this is interesting because you see that he did some research. See all the footnotes there? Which is very practical because not only you have references, but you can go right away and you know exactly where to go to find the opinion of you know, B.O. or whoever, uh, you have the reference, so that's very practical. I wonder, I'm looking for the, uh, no, the Van Noort, that's the original one here. So it's not the English version that was uh, uh, revised by, uh, by, diff by, author by authors. So, all right. Now the Vatican Council uh, and the Holy Father's Ordinary Magisterium. So let's look at that here. Despite the di divergent views uh, about the existence of infallible pontifical teaching in the encyclical letters, there is one point on which all theologians are manifestly in agreement. They are all convinced that all Catholics are bound in conscience to give a definite internal religious assent to these doctrines which the Holy Father teaches when he speaks to the universal church of God on earth without employing his God-given charism of infallibility. So there is no question about that. There is no question that it is at least religious assent binding on the pain of mortal sin that you cannot speak against it and so forth and so on. On that, everybody agrees. Okay? Also, another thing here, uh, he speaks again about the charism of infallibility. <laughs> Just to continue that theological you know, discussion that we started a few weeks ago. Uh, actually, a few days ago, I was reading uh, Mazzella, and he uh, classifies it as a charism, as a gratia gratis data. So, anyway, just for your uh, culture, I guess. But it's so I guess you can include it in a broad way. I, I'm not. I don't want to pronounce on it, but I think it's what we said last time is, is correct. That basically in a broad way you can classify it, but then if you want to be more precise as to the uh, ministries and the, the, the charisms, as in, you know, the gift of miracles and prophecies, then it won't be classified as a charism properly so called. Uh, all right, so. The, I'm jumping a little bit, a uh, few lines below. Uh, this ascent is due, as Lecher has noted, until the church might choose to modify the teaching previously presented or until proportionally serious reasons for abandoning the non-infallible teaching contained in a pontifical document might appear. But he says it would have to be very, very serious. Uh, okay, so the rest we already have said. Now, in the next page, we will, we will read the first uh, paragraph. So this is Monsignor Fenton, but he's very clear here about something uh, which I want to really insist on. He says, in this field, God has given the Holy Father a kind of infallibility distinct from the charism of doctrinal infallibility in the strict sense. So... Uh, we discussed about that already. Some will call it negative infallibility. Anyway, the point is, see what he says here. He has so constructed and ordered the church that those who follow the directives given to the entire kingdom of God on earth will never brought into the position of ruining themselves spiritually through disobedience. That would be a good tweet. But it, it's, it's, it, I mean... It's nice to see it written down, but obviously it makes a lot of sense. That, that is why the church exists. Again, if you follow the church... You go to heaven. Our Lord dwells within his church in such a way that those who obey the disciplinary and doctrinal directives of this society can never find themselves displeasing God through their adherence to the teachings and the commands given to the universal church militant. So whether it be the mass, whether it be doctrine, discipline, Hence, there can be no valid reason to discountenance even the non-infallible teaching authority of Christ's vicar on earth. 
So here he quotes uh, the De Filius uh, dogmatic constitution. Um, this is a little annoying, that noise all the time. Um, the, the from De Filius at the end where it reminds us that you have to, ag to adhere not only to ex cathedra pronouncement, but even to decrees of the Holy See. Uh, so look in the Latin, it says at the end, Servandi et siam constitutiones et decreta, quibus prave e iusmodi opiniones que istic disserte non enumerantur, ab ac sancta sede proscripte et prohibite sunt. Okay, here he refers to Vacan now, uh, Jean Vacan. He's a French theologian. He wrote quite a bit on the, um, uh, the First Vatican Council because he actually commented on it. And also he did write uh, a few things, but one of them is um, a little study on the ordinary uh, universal ordinary magisterium. So here it is, and it's very good because he explains, for example, we spoke about tacit, um, uh, approval by the bishops, or not? Like, for example, the fact that if if the church lets theologians teach a doctrine, uh, there is a tacit approval of what is taught. In the sense that if all the theologians say yes, this belongs to the doctrine of the church, then it does. Or if this belongs to the faith, then it does. Okay, because the magisterium of the church let those ideas prevail in the church, basically. So tacitly they approve it. You see. So uh, we actually uh, mentioned that in the notes, and uh, if you recall, I qu actually quoted him or refer to him. So we have the book here. It's in French. Uh, but it's not too it's not like it's not you know it's not both way or something. It's it's quite easy to read. All right. Let's move on. So uh in page one forty six I'm going to go through different things. At the second paragraph it says the Vatican Council speaks of a duty of a moral obligation Binding in conscience. So it's a duty, it's an obligation. Uh, next paragraph it says, It is important to note that the Vatican Council speaks of this obligation as something belonging to the integrity of the duty of faith itself. So, and because, uh, uh, three lines below, quote, It is not enough to keep away from heretical wickedness unless those errors which more or less closely approach it are also diligently avoided. End quote. So the idea is to preserve the faith, which is why, uh, if you recall, when we went through the table of Catechini, we saw that, uh, or, uh, or when, when we explained in, in the notes, when we explained the, uh, the obligation of this religious ascent and uh, the consequence of if you do not obey that, uh, we said it's, it's a mortal sin, and we said it, it may be uh, even a, a sin and directly against the virtue of, of faith, in as much as you actually put your faith in danger. Next paragraph, uh, Vacan and Schieben make it clear that in speaking of a decreta as distinct from the constitutions, the Vatican Council definitely included the pronouncements of the various Roman congregations among those teachings which Catholics are bound in conscience to accept perseveringly. Because, you know, the text of the Vatican Council says, Constitutiones et decretas. So somebody would say, ah, well, it doesn't speak about the Holy See. It speaks about the councils, whatever. But it's very clear from the context, from the discussions, also uh, the council, that it's a question of the decrees, even decrees of the, the Holy Office uh, and the, the obviously from, from the Holy Father as well. <coughs> All right, uh, next page in the middle. Uh, well, next page, <laughs> sorry, it's, uh, that means page 147, so it's still on the same copy here. But uh, the internal acceptance, that paragraph, the internal acceptance which Catholics are bound to give to that portion of the church's teaching, not presented absolutely as infallible, is described as a religious assent. Uh, it is truly religious by reason of its objects and its motives. So a few lines below, like seven lines below, he says, teachings that contradict errors of this sort are obviously religious in character since they deal more or less directly with the content of divine revelation, the body of truths which guides and directs the church of God in its worship. Well. Uh, next paragraph, the letter to us libenter, 
that's a very important letter here. Uh, we actually quoted it. I don't know if you recall, but it's a very important one. Well, I guess we'll quote it again, so I don't need to say what, what it says. But if you don't remember, so Popeyes the ele uh, Popeyes and I, I'm sorry, sent this to the Archbishop of Munich, uh, where they had a gathering of theologians and whatnot. So in any case, he said that the, uh, the dogma of the church was not only in solemn judgments, but also in the universal ordinary magisterium, which is obviously true and important. But then after that, if you look at the Latin on the other side, he says that it's not enough for Catholics, even theologians. And he says, Verum et siam opus esse, so the, you have to, uh, you have to follow this as well. Uh, would say, subdicion decisionibus, que a doctrinam pertinentes a pontificis congregationibus proferuntur. So here he is very clear. He speaks about the pontifical congregations. So uh, you have to submit to that. And he's actually speaking to theologians and learned men. So it's not just something that's good for the, you know, the woman in the pew or something. No, it, it is for the entire church, even for theologians. Uh, in the next paragraph, he says that basically the theologians should actually use that, uh, quote, in order that they may bring new advantages to the church by their writings, unquote. So basically, based on that, then they can continue and develop uh, the doctrine of the church, and they can defend it and they can prove it, uh, but always under the direction of the church. All right, so let's move on. At the, the bottom of uh, the page, it says, the religious assent of which the theologians speak is due to the individual doctrinal pronouncements of the various Roman congregations. It is due on manifestly strong, uh, stronger grounds to the individual doctrinal pronouncements not presented as infallible teachings, but set forth in papal encyclicals. Again, the obligation is even more powerful in a case of a body of teaching presented in a series of encyclicals. So sometimes they will speak about the same issue again and again. So, um, for example, he uh, he mentions in the next paragraph Rerum Novarum, which is Leo the Thirteenth, and Quadragesimo Anno, uh, which uh, I think it's Pope Pius XI. Am I wrong? Who spoke? Uh, right. He, he basically he confirm the teaching of Pope Leo XIII and, and continued on the same. So those are about social issues, uh, um, but uh, in any case, there is, a, there is a series, you might say, there is a continuity as well. So even when it's not infallible, the fact that they insist on it means it's very important. All right, so let's look at the next paragraph. It is, of course, it is, of course, possible that the church might come to modify its stand on some detail of teaching presented as non-infallible matter in a paper encyclical. Notice that he says some, a detail, though. It cannot be the essential. It's impossible because, again, the deposit of the faith always has to be there. The nature of the Auctoritas Providentiae Doctrinalis, so here he's using uh, Franzelin's uh, expression, within the church is such, however, that this infallibility extends to question of relatively minute detail or of particular application. The body of doctrine on the rights and duties of labor, so here he refers to uh, the social issues, on the church and state, or on any other subject treated extensively in a series of paper letters directed to and normative for the entire church militant could not be radically or completely erroneous. Okay? So even though you might say, okay, it's not directly infallible in the sense that he's not, he does not fulfill the conditions of the ex cathedra definition, yet because he, he's presenting the, this as Catholic doctrine, basically, and because the church has to keep the deposit of faith, it cannot be in such a way that, you know, he completely missed the points, you see? So this is very important. It cannot be radically or completely erroneous. The infallible security Christ wills that his disciples should enjoy within his church is utterly incompatible with such a possibility. It's not possible that the Catholic doctrine, because Catholic doctrine, we say, all right, Catholic doctrine is the body of teaching of the church, uh, which... It's the official doctrine, basically. Official doctrine of the church. All right? So there is things that are infallible in it and things that are not. <coughs> uh, 
but all the time there must be in this <laughs> you have to have the deposit of revelation it has to still be there some uh, at least implicitly you know it always has to be there so we might say well all right maybe you know a part on something might be wrong here because it's it's a little bit remote from the deposit of faith like it's a theological conclusion quite remote Perhaps they say, perhaps that's possible, but not in such a way that this is gone. Like, you cannot have a situation where the official doctrine is like this and the deposit of faith is like that. It's like, oh, yes, we're still some things that are in common, but there's a lot of it that we lost. Uh, you know, uh, transubstantiation, me, we don't believe it in it uh, anymore. Hell, well, we don't believe in it. All of, that's not possible. Always the deposit of faith still has to be there. It still has to be in the official doctrine of the church. So it's impossible that the official doctrine of the church will lose that, will kind of depart from it, even if it's not infallible, quote unquote. Okay? That's a very important point. So this is why he says it cannot be radically or completely erroneous. He said, okay, maybe in some details. And again, I don't I think they say that to be on the safe side, because I'm not even able to give you one example of it. Like I never, I don't know one instance where there was a detail that was corrected. Yes. I depends. I guess it depends how you formulate it because. The Pope is infallible in questions of morals, and uh, you know we do that in moral theology. So, yes, you don't. <laughs> yes, but the thing is, uh, first of all. Uh, Usually, I mean, actually, most of the time, the teaching of a church is very, very clear. You know exactly what it's what is meant by it. And if there is an ambiguity, then the Holy See or the, the Pope or whoever is going to, uh, as soon as possible, take care of it, basically, and make it clear, you know, so that there won't be left any ambiguity. But what is true is that, yes, things have to be understood, obviously, in the proper context. I think we said that last time already, but if I say you are saved through faith, or the Pope says that in an encyclical, it's obvious he's not Martin Luther. He doesn't mean you, you don't need works, right? So every time there will be uh, something that perhaps out of context could be taken in a non-Catholic way, obviously you should not take it like that, obviously, right? So in that sense, if you have ambiguity, like if you take it out of context perhaps, but in the context, no, you don't. And it's, <laughs> if there is, again, I would gi like give me an example of an ambiguity. Like it, there's no ambiguity, yes? It's not, it's not ambiguous. He left it open, but it's not ambiguous. We know what he says and what he doesn't say, right? Yes, so it's not something, but I wonder from the perspective of a thing of science, which is so big that evolution is slow, and whether he can hold privately or even that uh, Holy Father went so far, and I don't give. Uh, no, because he's, uh, 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 Popeye's XII is not saying you have to be an evolutionist at all. She's not saying that. So if you are a scientist and you're like, well, no, evolution is wrong. I don't believe. It. Fine. It doesn't. There's no problem there. He doesn't ask you to actually believe in evolution. Yes, but in current, in current activity, uh, deep and talking is himself very But it's not a contradiction because the Pope is, is coming from the side of doctrine. He's coming from the side of science. So the fact that scientifically he proves that there is no evolution, I mean, fine. It, it doesn't, I don't see the problem there. It's not a contradiction. He can, he can say, yes, uh, this is, the, you know, the evolution is false, and that's it. Because he knows it from science. That it's not, I don't see any problem with that. Yes, 
Yeah, no, no, I mean, it's not a problem. The sense is, uh, first of all, when we spoke about ambiguity, it's basically you are not sure what the holy fire means. In, the, in this case, we exactly know what he means. And he was basically, uh, for the folks who don't know, uh, Pope Pius XII uh, left, it seems, the, the, the door open to uh, some Catholic version of evolution in a sense that, okay, God made man from, from matter, obviously, but he could have, and Pope Pius XII leaves that open, he says basically that it's, it would not contradict the, the uh, uh, sacred scripture to think that God might have used uh, in the process might have used and um, basically matter that was already something else than just earth um, so some people will say oh then evolution can go that way but it's not an evolution with first of all without the intervention of God there's no question there so but in any case if you say no 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 there is no proof of that uh, it never happened fine it, it it does not contradict Pope Pius XII he actually just left it open and say well, you know we need to we need to deepen that we need to be more precise about that he just left it open so if he left it open, then <laughs> you're fine, you know? So it does not contradict that. Then on the part of science, you might be like, well, it's proven scientifically that it's false. Fine, you see? But he's coming from the, s the side of sacred scripture saying it is open, you, can, you could take it that way. Uh, and uh, basically he says that, that would not contradict scripture. Okay? But he he he's not coming from the side of science. He didn't make a he didn't make a uh, an obligation or anything on the part of science as to what you have to hold. Okay. So um, so it's not ambiguous. We know exactly what he means. And sometimes yes, they will leave the door open for many things. Well, I mean, the question of grace is an obvious obvious case, right? Where um, and other times things are going to be more and more precise. But many times yes, when there are disputed issues. Uh, the, the, the Pope will basically leave the debate open to some extent. But it's not an ambiguity, it's just, okay, for now, I don't want to pronounce on that. Like we, um, we mentioned the question of ecclesiastical faith, for example, that it seems has not been decided yet, right? Uh, so I guess if the Holy See one day decides it, then it's going to be clear. But it's not an ambiguity, it's just still something that is open for discussion, basically, okay? Okay, so um, after that, always still on the same page here, we have an interesting case of something that was open for discussion and is no longer. And this is the question of the origin of authority for the bishops. So we already spoke about that one uh, quite a, uh, a lot, actually. But he says, in the matter of individual pronouncement, it is interesting to observe the teaching of one of the most competent and respected scholars in the church on the doctrinal effect produced by a statement in a papal encyclical. So he refers to uh, Ottaviani, actually. The encyclical Mystici Corporis speaks of the bishop's ordinary power of jurisdiction as something, quote, communicated to them immediately by the sovereign pontiff. End quote. So we already said that it was disputed in the past whether it came from Christ through the Roman, Roman pontiff or not. And the answer is yes, it does. Uh, Pope Isaac XII settled that in Mystici Corporis. So Monsignor Alfredo Ottaviani, in the latest edition of his Instituciones Juris Publici Ecclesiastici, uh, speaks of this doctrine as, quote, sentencia ucusque considerata probabilia imo communis nun cautem ut omnino certa abenda ex verbis sumi pontificis pi duodecimi. So, uh, the sentence that until now was considered to be more probable <coughs> uh, or even common, but now is absolutely certain from the words of Pope Isaac XII. We have that book in the library, but I don't know if it's uh, the same edition or not. But we have uh, Ottaviani's book on public public law. He has some interesting things in there, actually. <coughs> All right, so uh, do you have questions on the first part here? No? I think it's a lot of things that we already have covered, so it, it should be... Uh, Smooth. Hopefully I'm not making you fall asleep. <coughs> All right. Uh, 
so uh, part two, he begins referring to that fact again, Monsignor Ottaviani, changing or precising his, uh, his opinion on, on the authority of, of the bishops, uh, saying now it's absolutely certain that this is what it is because Pope Isaac XII said it in Mystici Corporis. Uh, and it's interesting also, look at that, he says that uh, in the first paragraph, he says Pope Isaac XII basically he explained this teaching in Mystici Corporis, but he said he also explained it or he said it to the parish priest and the Lenten preacher, preachers of Rome. <coughs> if one of you can find that, uh, tell me, because I have looked for that, I remember in the past, I have looked for that for hours and couldn't find it. So if, if one of you has that allocution, it seems like it's, it's a kind of allocution or discourse that Pope Pius XII did to priests and Lenten preachers in Rome, where he already had actually a year before Mystici Corpus explained that the uh, bishops got their uh, uh, authority from the Pope. So if, if, one of you, uh, if one of you finds that, uh, please let me know. Uh, I couldn't find it. Uh, but you can look for that later, not, not now. Thank you. All right, uh, at the bottom of the page, it remains true, of course, that this designation of the thesis as entirely certain is the work of a private theologian. <laughs> that would be a good quote. Uh, no, but basically, now, okay, Pope Pius XII just sta he said it like that. He said that the bishops get their authority immediately from the Roman pontiff. Now, Cardinal Ottaviani is saying, therefore, now it's absolutely certain because he said it. Obviously, it, it only has the authority of Cardinal Ottaviani. That is true, yet we are sometimes tempted to overlook the no less obvious fact that the process of taking together all those teachings whose chief claim uh, to acceptance in the Church of God on Earth in their inclusion in a papal encyclical and listing them as uh, all simply as morally certain is likewise the work of private theologians. <laughs> so when we said, you know, we, you need to give religious assent, you have more certainty about the truth uh, of this and blah, 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 all of this also is said by theologians. So he, do you understand the point he makes or not? I don't know. Yes? So it's a very threshold of how big a theologian you take to achieve moral certainty? No, uh, the <laughs> it, it's not really a number, you know, it's not, a, it's not really a, a number, but uh, in moral theology, you, there is a number of theologians f in order for you to uh, safely follow something, but it's just a question of safety. It doesn't give you, uh, uh, like, um, and it's for moral issues, like in a practical order, what do you do? But normally, you, if you have a big name as St. Thomas, St. Alphonsus in moral theology, for example, uh, that would uh, give you a good authoritative argument, or if you have about six, uh, five or six uh, theolo approved theologians. But it's for moral certainty in, in moral issues, because in moral issues, you don't need to have an absolute certainty about what you're doing. But here we're speaking about dogma, so it, it won't make it certain in the sense of uh, philosophical certainty, um, but enough to act, basically, that's the idea. <coughs> yes? If it's a theologian's teach, is that a doubtful exception to that, or should it be? If it is a common a co a thing. Look, uh, we have that in the table, actually. Uh, Try to get Catechini's table, and uh, you will see that it's uh, it's in there. <coughs> if all the theologians agree to something, then yes, you have to follow it. Uh, let me see. Yes, yeah, so look at category number nine. Uh, no. Well, I guess it will be number seven where you would have everybody would agree. Commune omnibus scholis. It's common to all the schools. That is, everybody agrees on it. So it would be possibly a, mort uh, a mortal sin of, of uh, temerity, rashness, to just reject it. But if it's uh, just um, like a more common, uh, then you are free to, to agree to it or not. Obviously, you need good reasons for that. It shouldn't be just out of you know pride or something.
But you see, for example, he puts in the in category number 10 at the bottom, in the example, he gives the example of grace. Moninismus vel benazianismus. So that, that's the way the Jesuits call the Thomas theory of grace, but whatever. Uh, <laughs> so in any case, for, for things like uh, the theory of grace, uh, you could follow the opinion of the Jesuits if you, con if you are convinced it's true. You would just be wrong, right? That's all. So another one, actually, and um, the uh, the question of the heretical pope actually is also the same status. It's actually dis disputed to this day. So there's no you can you are free to think the positus the ponendus. There's no moral uh, agreement at all. Uh, yes. No, because actually, uh <laughs> first of all, it's not safe because you might get in trouble here. No, I'm kidding. But <laughs> no, but actually, I'm surprised he wrote Molinism because the strictest Molinism, actually, even the Jesuits do not hold that anymore. They went to Congreism, which is a, like a, a lighter version, I suppose, with St. Robert Bellamy and others. Uh, it's still wrong, but... Because the uh, the most obvious uh, proposition of, of Molinism, actually, uh, even the, um, I think it's Aquaviva, the name of the Jesuit, I forgot, but the, the superior of the Jesuits, he himself actually made a statement saying, you know, you cannot hold this and this and that, uh, and taken from, from Molinism, basically, that were too extreme. It was almost semi-Pelagianism. Semi so pure Molinism, I would say, no, it's not safe, actually. <laughs> Uh, but congruism, you might say it's safe, like objectively, in the sense if you think it's true and you don't fall into crazy things, all right? But my opinion is not, for me, it wouldn't be safe, for example, because <laughs> I would be basically knowingly stepping on the truth, so that's not very safe. But um, yeah, objectively, it's still allowed, basically, for now. I don't know, for a long time. Actually, most, if you, if you again, if you take the number of, of offers, you might actually, will, uh, you might actually find more offers uh, on the Jesuit side on that, because they did write a lot of books, and they had great influence. Okay, in any case, let's move on. <coughs> but yeah, Molinism won't be safe for you, because <laughs> you would just get an F at the exam if you were Molinist. <laughs> Uh, so that's not too safe. Um, all right, now I lost myself. Okay, more more certainty. Um, okay, after that, at the middle, in the middle of the page, we have the quote from the Vatican Council from Pastor Eternus, where the infallibility of the Pope is being defined. And after that, uh, Monsignor Fenton comments on that, saying, In this passage, the Council proclaimed it to be a dogma of Catholic faith that the, the Holy Father teaches infallibly when he gives an ex cathedra definition on matters involving faith or morals. First of all, in order to understand the, the import of this conciliar statement, we must understand that it in no way limits uh, papal infallibility to dogmatic definitions strictly so-called. The language of the Council was deliberately framed to exclude this limitation. During the sessions of the Council's uh, Deput Deputatio Pro Rebus Ad Fidem Pertinentibus, Cardinal Bilio uh, procured the temporary adoption of a formula, it's not the same as Bilio, huh? formula proposed by Bishop Conrad Martin of uh, Paderborn, uh, Paderborn, according to which the Holy Father would be said to exercise infallibly in defining quid in rebus fidei et morum, Ab universa ecclesia fide divine, uh, divina tenendum. The strenuous opposition of Archbishop Henry Edward Manning and of Bishop Ignatius Senestri prevented the final approval of this formula. The wording ultimately adopted and used in the actual constitution, Pastor Eternus, was substantially that proposed by Cardinal Curran, a formula drawn up deliberately to exclude the limitation involved in the one offered by Martin and Bilio, so uh, the fide catholica credendum. Uh, that was taken away. Uh, hence, it is a grievous mistake to imagine that, according to the teachings of the Vatican Council, the Holy Father can speak infallibly only when he solemnly proclaims a dogma of divine faith, 
or when he solemnly condemns some teaching as heretical. Thus, the fact that the encyclicals do not contain solemn definitions like that of a dogma of the Immaculate Conception or solemn condemnations of heresy like that contained in the Constitution Cum Occasione of Pope Innocent X in no way militates against the inclusion of strictly infallible papal teaching in these documents. So then he goes on and on. Um, Uh, in the next page, in the, uh, the paragraph at the top, towards the end of the paragraph, he says, we already said that it is at least theologically certain that the church can teach infallibly about mere theological conclusions and about those truths of the philosophical order which serve as preambula fidei, about dogmatic facts, the approval of religious orders, the canonizations of saints. So the secondary object of infallibility, we already said that the church is infallible in that, and the fact that the church is infallible in that is at least theologically certain, but I did mention to you that the Vatican Council uh, did not want, so again, it's not a question of ambiguity, it's just it left it open. The Vatican Council did not want to say whether that itself is a truth of faith, or if it's just for now a theological certainty. So they, it, it is at least theologically certain though. All right, I guess uh, we'll take the break here and we'll come back. <laughs>